When we start our career, you're aware of the legacy leaders that came before you, the people who shaped the industry that we've chosen. In advertising, it's the names like Bill Bernbach, Neil French, David Ogilvy, just to name a few. But back in the mid-1980s, when I first met our honorary recipient, when we both landed a great job at the advertising agency um, Campbell Ewald, I don't think either of us had any idea where this path was going to take us. Every industry has its stars, past, present, and advertising is no exception. The very nature of advertising and the number of different industries that it touches has resulted in some of the biggest players becoming household names. And for us, Terry O'Reilly is just that. Whether we're addicted to listening to him recount marketing and brand stories on Under the Influence, which celebrates its 10th anniversary on CBC in January, or reading the comical and often irreverent tales in his book, The Age of Persuasion, which is also now part of our recommended reading in our advertising program. He owns the world of broadcast advertising. He's a well-known brand, a storyteller, an educator, and a world-renowned orator. But more than that, he was a trailblazer like those who came before him. Beginning his career in radio at FM 108 in Burlington, he then went on to become an award-winning copywriter for Campbell Ewald, DDB, and Shiat Day. He created campaigns for many of the best-known brands in the world, including Molson, Labatt, Pepsi US, Tim Hortons, Volkswagen, Hudson's Bay Company, just to name a few. In 1990, Terry co-founded Pirate Radio and Television, producing scripts, sound, and music for both radio and television and notably known for its groundbreaking creative and, more importantly to clients, results, the company grew to over 50 people with offices in both Toronto and New York. One of the many things I love about Terry is his modesty. When asked how many awards he's won, he says, oh, a few hundred. Notably, these awards are for his writing and directing and working with such well-known actors as Alec Baldwin, Bob Newhart, Ellen DeGeneres, Martin Short, and years ago with me at a shoot in LA, Artie Johnson. He has been a judge at the Cannes Advertising Festival in France. He was named radio chairman for both the International CLE Awards in Miami as well as the London International Awards. And with all that, he stays remarkably grounded and devoted to his roots, Canada. So joining the legions of great advertising ad icons, who have helped to shape the way we look at this crazy business. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to this year's honorary degree recipient, my colleague and friend, Terry O'Reilly. My pleasure. Wow, what an introduction that I can't possibly live up to now. <clears throat> Thank you, Meryl. What an amazing afternoon when I look out at all those wonderful faces in your gowns. Congratulations to the graduates and to the families and the faculty and staff joining me up here on the stage. What an honor it is to be here today. I thought a lot about what I wanted to say today. And I thought what I would do is tell you four brief stories from my career. When I was looking for my very first job, as an advertising copywriter in the early 80s. I was fresh out of school. I was your age, in your position, looking for my first job. And I sent out 60 resumes to 60 different advertising agencies. And I promptly got back 61 rejection letters. <laughs> yes, one agency actually rejected me twice. I realized then that I would probably have to make appointments with creative directors to get a job because it was just too easy to turn down a mailed-in resume. So I spent time putting together a speculative portfolio of ads that I just made up because that's what copywriters have to do to get a job. And when I was ready, I thought, okay, I'm going to make a list of the top advertising agencies in Canada, who, make a list of who their creative directors are and call them up to try and get an interview. 
And I remember when I had all that information ready to go, having my hand on the phone for 10 minutes, trying to get up the courage to make the first call. Because I had nothing to offer, really. I accept a fresh point of view, the promise to work hard, no credentials, no track record, not even any real ads in my portfolio. And I knew creative directors were the busiest people on the planet. And I knew they really didn't have time to talk to a green copywriter like me. Then I thought, OK, all they can say to me is no. So I picked up the phone, took a deep breath, called the first creative director, managed to get him on the line, which was incredible to me. And <clears throat> I told him, OK, I'm a green copywriter. I have a spec book of, of ads I'd love to show you. I'll be in and out of your office in two minutes. I'll only take two minutes of your time. And he said, OK, come and see me two days from now at 9 o'clock in the morning at our office. And I hung up, and I couldn't believe I actually had an interview. When I finally met that creative director on that morning, he breezed into the office with a full-length fur coat, floor-length fur coat on. Even his coat was intimidating. And I could tell he was successful and important and that this interview was the first speed bump in his very busy day. But he called me into his office, went through my spec portfolio in about four seconds, and then offered me two weeks, <clears throat> two weeks of employment. And as we stood there shaking hands, I said, <clears throat> but if you like me, will you keep me on full time? And he just looked at me and he said, we'll see. So my first phone call, first interview, now I'm actually in an advertising agency writing commercials. My dream come true for at least two weeks. Ten days later, he hired me. And I remember about two months after that, I noticed that some senior people in the agency were struggling with a big television project for our biggest client. The client had turned everything down. There was a lot of pressure on the agency, a lot of pressure on the senior uh, creative people in our shop. So uh, one day I thought, I'm going to go talk to the creative director. I'm going to go knock on his door and ask him if I can take a crack at this project. And when I got to his door, I panicked. And I couldn't knock on the door because it was just such a big request. You know, it was just an outrageous request for me to ask to be put on that assignment. So as I turned around to leave, he burst out of his office, saw me, and he said, yes, Terry? And I went, um could I get a crack at that TV spot for that big client we're working on? And he looked at me and he said, uh, and there I was, you know, two whole months under my belt asking for the biggest project in the agency. And he said to me, paused, and he said, okay, I want ideas by tomorrow morning. So I went home, I worked all night. I think I came up with an idea around 4 a.m., went into work that morning, presented it to the creative director, and he loved it. And then before you know it, I was in Chicago, you know, uh, working with the biggest, most uh, uh, famous commercial director in advertising, shooting this commercial. And the client loved it. People loved it when it hit the air. And it went on to win the gold award for the best television spot of the year that year. That commercial changed the trajectory of my career. Suddenly, the creative director was bringing me on. I'm bringing me in on all the top projects, the industry took notice of me, and I didn't stay a junior for very long. Story number two. A few years later, I was a senior writer at Shiat Day, as Merrill was mentioning, which at the time was arguably probably the most creative and most famous advertising agency in our industry. The agency was founded by the very legendary Jay Shiat, who suffered no fools. And the creative director was, a, was probably the most famous creative director in our business named Lee Clow. They had done all the work for Apple with Steve Jobs. So these people already had incredible credentials. The agency was based in Los Angeles. I was in Toronto when they opened up here. And I had never met Lee or Jay. They were really just these famous people in Los Angeles. They were these overlords from a distance. So our Toronto agency got invited to pitch a Labatt beer, which is the biggest pitch we've been invited to to that point. And when we were planning the presentation, my boss said, OK, who's going to present the creative work to uh, Labatt? Who in the creative department is going to do that? And nobody put up their hand, because there was a lot riding on that. So then I swallowed hard, 
put my hand up, and he said, great, O'Reilly will present the creative, and then he went on to assign other roles for the presentation. And I realized why nobody had put their hands up later th uh, that day, because Jay Scheid and Lee Clow were flying in to be part of the presentation, and nobody wanted to be, to present in front of them. So, it was too late, I'd already stuck my hand up. I was on the hook for it now. So when the big day arrived, we were in the boardroom at Labatt, the longest, shiniest boardroom table you have ever seen in your whole life. And Jay Shiat, the famous Jay Shiat, walked up to me minutes before I was to present, and he said to me, so, do you feel well rehearsed for this presentation? I said, yeah, I feel, I feel kind of good, Jay. He said, great, we'll see, won't we? Like, I feel that sweat drip right here. <laughs> but I managed to get it together. I presented the creative work. It went well. The Bats awarded us a big brand of beer. And my currency went up at Shiat Day and with the great Jay Shiat and Lee Clow. Story number three. Just when I was at the high point of my career, making a really big salary and working at what I thought was the best agency in North America, I decided I wanted to open up my own company. Now all I had to do was convince my wife. We had just bought our first home, we just had our first baby, and here I was wanting to leave a well-paying job all within 18 months. And I was 29. When I finally worked up the courage to bring it up to my wife, I said, here's what I'd like to do, and I explained it to her. And she just kind of stared at me for what seemed like 10 minutes. And I could see she was doing some serious math in her head. And then she said, what's the worst thing that can happen to us? And I said, well, we could lose our house. And she paused again and said, well, I guess we can always find another house. Let's do it. And for that moment alone, I'll always love that redhead over there. And that was 1989, and the company was Pirate Radio and Television. And 25 years later, that company is still growing and thriving. And here's my last story. In 2005, I found myself in the boardroom of CBC, sitting across the desk from the head of CBC Radio. I was there with a friend to pitch a crazy radio show idea about advertising. Now, I knew a lot about advertising. I knew nothing about running or creating a weekly radio show. It was pretty presumptuous to make that pitch in hindsight. Why should the head of CBC Radio give over the airwaves to two people who have never, ever, ever done a radio show before? Why should he greenlight a show about advertising, a subject most people dislike? on a station with no advertising, on a network most people flee to, to avoid advertising. But we took a deep breath and we made the presentation. And as Merrill said, I'll be starting my 10th season on CBC. Graduates, the big beats in your life and your career will hinge on certain moments. And it'll be easy to recognize those moments because your heart starts to pump, your mouth goes dry, you swallow really hard. But you know if you don't speak up, that moment will pass you by. You'll know it. And when I look back on my career and those important beats, the fear holding me back, because all those moments I just described to you scared me half to death, those moments holding me back were the fear was always unfounded when it finally unfolded. It was just the fear of the unknown. And once the unknown became known and you look back on it, it wasn't nearly as scary as, I, as you think it's going to be. So when you find yourself in those important moments in your career, which you will all face, I want you to remember something. Jump and the net will appear. Don't be afraid to take a risk. Because most of the time, I'm here to tell you, you'll take that leap and you'll land safely. Life shrinks or expands depending on how much courage you have. 
And one thing I've learned over the years is you have to ask for the big opportunities. You can't wait for them to come to you. You have to ask for them. So I hope you take a little piece of this talk with you when you leave here today and when you leave this wonderful school. Tuck it away in your heart or write it on a little slip of paper and keep it in your purse, keep it in your wallet, and just write, jump in the net will appear on that little piece of paper, fold it up, put it away for when you need it. And when those occasions arrive, and they will, and you feel that mild panic set on, you feel that little sweat drip, pull that little piece of paper out and read it. And remind yourself that that big opportunity is yours for the taking if you just stick your hand up. Jump and the net will appear. And that decision will change your life and take you in directions that will be fantastic. And years from now, when you find you have landed in the power seat and you've taken the risks and you've made it to the top, don't forget to send the elevator back down. Remember how you felt when you were just starting out, how intimidating it feels. Remember that feeling you have today where you're excited and a little unsure and give a helping hand to a student who's just starting their career. Be known in your respective industries as someone who cares. So congratulations, Humber graduates. What an amazing day for you. The world awaits, and we can't wait to marvel at the amazing jumps you will take. Thank you so much.